What is up, everyone? I'm Jeff Lund, and this is the Mediocre Alaskan Podcast, where we are intolerant of weak-minded attitudes that keep people from pursuing new and exciting things in the areas of fitness, outdoors, and general lifestyle. Talking with my buddy Steve Shannon again from uh, Fairbanks. Going to talk some gear, going to talk some packs, bows. Uh, We're going to talk responsible spending, especially in the winter months, and we're also going to talk about that primal urge that drives us into the woods to do some hunting. This episode is brought to you by LMT. Go to lmtlifestyle.com, check out the gear that we have. And here we go, episode 24, Gears and Hunts and Whatnot with Steve Shannon. So I uh, I went to Barney's Chalet and I was checking that out and I was looking at the packs. You have the Hunter, yes. right? Yeah. Um, that thing looks sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, looks looks the 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 bag i have right now holds 3700 or has 3700 um cubic inches and this thing is 60 yeah and if you're not careful you will fill it (laughs) oh yeah yeah that's i went out for like it was one of those uh i knew it was going to be an overnight and i wasn't I, i planned to sleep in the truck but I was going to hike in like three or four miles for a caribou. And, uh, the plan was to sleep in the truck, but I was like, ah, if I get one down, I might have to sleep right there. And very quickly my like overnight pack became like 50 pounds and I just carried it around for <laughs> all day. So yeah, it was, uh, it's cavernous, man. You'll just start putting things in it and you're like, yeah, I got room for that. I think you're there. <laughs> well, the, the problem I had with mine is, it's somewhat waterproof. And so Southeast Alaska it rains so much. So I have dry bags in there that have my gear. Yeah. And when I get the deer, I put the gear in the pack or the, the deer in the pack. And then the gear goes on the outside, but then it's just a matter of trying to figure out a way with bungee cords or with, with, with paracord to get it affixed to the frame somehow. But then you're going through the brush and everything and it's just pulling stuff uh, away from it and there's no spot for the gun. So it'd be nice to have more space to do that. Understanding that I'm probably going to fill in with, with way more stuff than I need, but, uh, I, it just, it's cumbersome and it's a pain to have to have everything else in dry bags and then affix it to the outside and put the deer in there. So I'm, I'm excited at the prospect of having everything contained and enclosed, um, is it waterproof? Mostly waterproof. What's the, yeah, it's mostly waterproof. Um, the, uh, I'm trying to think they, they, they sell like a big pack cover for it too. Um, so it's not a hundred percent. Like if it was pouring down rain, you couldn't leave your pack outside the tent, but, um, like it sheds water pretty well. And I've taken and sprayed it down with, uh, you know, like Nick wax, they make some different treatments and sprays and stuff like that. And you can spray that down. And it'll help the waterproofing a little bit. Nice. Uh, I, I usually keep my stuff in the, um, like tent and everything in a dry bag anyway. So that way when I'm unloading the bag and if it happens to be sitting outside for, you know, a couple seconds or a couple of minutes while I'm getting something else done, it'll stay dry food bag. So, um, that'd be, that'd be nice. I also see the outside pockets look like it's at a, like a totally different or independent appendage. The one I have, if you put stuff in the side pockets, it then encroaches on the interior space. So it looks nice that I'm going to have all the, well, I'm already acting like I'm going to buy it, which I guess that's a sign. My subconscious is saying it's going to happen anyway, just a matter of time. So you can resist all you want, but you're going to end up buying it. Um, but you, uh, say you also have a stone glacier. I do. Yeah, I know I do. I, uh, and I thought about, I was probably in response. I had the, uh, the, the hunter from the Barney's pack first. And it was so big. I bought the, um, actually I had a buddy who was selling his stone glacier frame and another buddy who was selling his solo bag, which was a 3,300. And, uh, I bought that and put them together. And, uh, yeah, it was probably in, <laughs> as a result of her in reaction to having such a huge pack, uh, something a little bit smaller that I wouldn't be so tempted to carry everything with. Yeah. Um, if, uh, if that, that Barney's bag isn't full, does it feel weird that you only, it's, it's only half full? Is it like off balance or anything or is it still? No, no, it's got, um, I was, I'm on the website right now looking at the picture that's there and the big lid for it doesn't quite show all the straps underneath. You can cinch that thing down pretty tight. Um, Wait. and then you're right about the external pockets. They're completely external. I think it's got like a big spotting scope, 
um, pouch. And then, then I think uh, on mine on the hunter, it's got two smaller pockets on the other side that you can kind of fill with odds and ends. Mm-hmm. And the uh, and you have access. Does it have like the zipper down so you can open it, or is it purely a top load? Um, purely a top load. That middle bag is purely top load. So I think one of the Stone Glacier models has where you can lay it down and zip it like it's a like it's a duffel, and then you clip it, and then you like stand it up, and and it's easier to get to all parts of it so you're not burying everything at the at the bottom yeah there's some pretty there's some pretty slick stuff i like my the way the zipper works on my solo um it basically zips down half or maybe two-thirds of the body of the pack so you can easily reach stuff down on the bottom without turning it over um the other part of it is uh I, both of them kind of are pretty limited on like interior pockets. Um, I think there's one pocket on that stone glacier bag, which I like. Um, I don't need, I carry a lot of stuff in dry bags inside my bag. Um, a couple of years ago, I was f- doing a moose hunt and was floating the China, uh, upper China with a friend of mine. And we flipped our canoe in a, in a sweeper. And it was like, I'm probably my second or third year out doing this and I didn't have anything in really plastic. So when my bag went in, the only thing that was dry was the stuff in the very, very center of my pack. Um, so that was a learning experience that I keep at least a dry set of clothes and things like that in, uh, like a seal, what do you call it? Seal skin bag or seal. Yeah. Sea yeah. Sea line bags. Um, so that was pretty good. Uh, and then I started doing that with like my kill kit. So all my game bags and game knives and stuff like that go in one too. And it was an easier way to kind of keep things compartmentalized that I didn't have to dig through everything. Um, yeah. So I started doing that. So I don't need a whole lot of pockets on my stuff. Um, but yeah, yeah so those. You, take a, you say you take a, a change of, of clothes. If you're going, what's the longest hunt you've been on and how many, how many pairs of clothes did you bring? Uh, like, six days out there, like just without anybody else, kind of like, you know, not going to the truck in between that kind of thing about six days. And, um, I, I limit what I bring. Usually I bring one extra pair of underwear, uh, always bring an extra pair of socks at least. Um, yeah. But otherwise I've got my, in terms of like my outer layers, I'm sure you could tell by my cat, my packing list I sent you. I like a lot of Kuyu stuff. I, I swear by their attack pants. Um, so I usually wear one pair of attack pants. I've got a set of long underwear or maybe two, depending upon the, the weather and then my rain gear. And I figure with the rain gear, the attack pants and at least one set of long underwear on, that's be pretty warm for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, did you, have you had any Sitka um, products? I haven't had a chance to use any of those yet. Um, I have a friend who likes them a lot. Uh, he also is, I think gets a little bit of a, like a guiding discount as well. So I think that helps in terms of that. Cause like when I go to sportsman's warehouse here in Fairbanks and try to find some stuff for Sitka, it's, it's pretty spendy. Um, yeah. Well, it was interesting that Sitka was like the brand and then after the ownership split or whatever, um, now Kuyu is the, that's the new one. That's the, that's the trendy. That's the big, that's the, you know, if, if Sitka is the sellout, then you go with this brand. But <laughs> I, I think it just, whatever you happen to get your hands on it first. Cause I don't think, well, actually I know there are, but, but the casual sort of, of Hunter doesn't have enough money to, switch brands like that. You kind of buy it once really, really well. And then because they've come up with a new pattern, I don't know of many people who are selling out, getting a new pattern or going to a new company just because of whatever. Cause that's, it's just not cost effective to buy another $1,500 system. <laughs> yeah, no, not at all. Especially when you have other, other hobbies or people, you know, you got a wife or a girlfriend that guides you in spending money. Yeah. yeah. It's definitely not, able like for this last pair i ended up getting two pairs of pants and a pair of gloves from kuyu 
uh, a friend of mine works for FEMA and he was down in California last year with some of the wildfires and happened to be in Dixon, California where the headquarters is when uh, they were doing their, when Kuyu was doing the garage sale. So I texted him and told him if you see any pants of any kind in a, in a 34 waist, pick them up for me, man. And he ended up bringing back two pairs of pants and a pair of gloves. And I think I paid 90 bucks for all of it. Oh, yeah, nice. it was outstanding. Yeah. And, uh, I think the one pair of pants had a rip in the waist and I, I've started sewing. So, uh, I sewed those up. I hemmed both pairs and I got two good pairs of pants now and a decent pair of gloves for not a lot of money, but you're right. Like I go to, like I'll go peruse the camel section and see what's going on. And you know, you're talking sometimes $200 for a pair of pants. It's pretty crazy quick. Yeah. I have two pairs of, of Sitka pants. Uh, some buddies came up to do some, some bear hunt. They had, uh, they had Kuyu and it looks nice. It's great. It's to people who like camo and like gear. It's very attractive. And like, Ooh, gosh, that, that'd be kind of cool to have, but totally irrational to have both. Cause the pants that I have work the outer, uh, shell, um, the rain gear. I've, I've put a couple of holes in it. Cause just, that's just going to happen. And it's funny to see on, those Facebook groups and everyone complaining about, Oh, I just, I, I took out and I, and I got a hole in my pants cause I was just sliding down some rocks. Uh, so just because you spent two bucks on a pair of pants doesn't mean that it's going to be impervious to everything. You're still going to, you're st- it's still going to be able to be worn down. It's still going to be able to be torn. It's not absolutely, it's not a force field. You know, it's, it's, so it's funny to see some of these people who expect it to, $200 means it will absolutely not break down no chance of tearing because that's going to happen. But you would also think that for 200 bucks, 300 bucks, whatever it is that it would take something really, really special in order to break it down. Um, I don't know, man. I, uh, I'm, I'm intrigued also by that first light stuff that you see on uh Ranella's yeah. show, the interesting pattern, um, but look like they've got some good products too, but hey, that's going to be the same sort of price. I'm not sure. Is that stuff new? Do you, do you know if, if that's a newer brand or if it's been around or, or what? Um, I'm going to do my own research right now. I know Joe, I was talking about Joe Rogan podcast earlier. He's got that guy. He's like, Hey, yeah, look that up real quick. See when, when they came around. So I, I don't have somebody to do that. I'm going to do that myself. Yeah, yeah, it's nice having the computer right in yeah, front. Uh, 2007, it says first light started, and I have I've got a few of their things. Um, they have like a 200 or 210 gram merino hoodie called the Chama, and that's like my weekend gig, man. I bring that thing everywhere, and every weekend I wear that pretty much every. I'd wear it every single day, but the kids would think it was gross. Um, but I think that thing's awesome. I also really like their, um, they have their, it sounds weird, wool underwear, but they've got these Merino wool boxer briefs that are, uh, they're super, super soft to the skin. And then they're an extra long inseam. Like they go almost down to the top of my kneecap. And for me, I have thicker legs. So if it doesn't do that, it tends to ride up the other direction, but because so long i can just if they do start to ride up like on a, a steep climb or something you can just grab the ends of them right at the end of your leg or at the end of your knee and pull them down instead of having to dig in your yeah. spots <laughs> yeah but well, yeah both of those are awesome but the same thing like you were talking about uh you go to their first light buy sell facebook page or whatever and it's guys complaining that it didn't last and it wore a hole in it and it's like it's still wool. It's still, you can't go climb a tree with this wool sweater on and expect it not to get some snags in it or people that dry it. Like yeah. put it in the dryer and it shrunk. Yeah. That's what happens yeah. when you get wet wool dry really fast. So yeah, I'm just being careful with stuff. After years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by big wireless providers, if we've learned anything, it's that there's always a catch. So when I first heard that Mint Mobile offers premium wireless starting at just 15 bucks a month, I thought, what's the catch? But after talking to them and using their service, it all made sense. There isn't one. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they're the first company to sell wireless service 
online only. They cut out the cost of retail stores and pass those sweet savings directly to you. For anyone who hates their phone bill, Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month. I was hesitant about having to get a new phone and a new phone number, but with Mint, you can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone and your same phone number along with all of your existing contacts. Mint Mobile gives you the best rate whether you're buying for one or for a family, and at Mint, families start at two lines. All plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and to get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com/waypoint. That is mintmobile.com/waypoint. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash waypoint. Yeah. The, uh, the pants thing is always, I, it, it doesn't seem like I can get enough pair of hunting type pants. The, I'm looking at the obsidian Merino pants. They got the suspenders on it, but just the pockets and there's the zipper and they just look comfortable and they look, but it's, I have pants. So why would I want another pair of pants? Why do I, I don't need, especially for 170 bucks, I don't need them, but they, they just look different enough to anything that I don't have currently with my pants. These would provide, and I should get them, but that's not true. I shouldn't. Well, I mean, you don't know that's not true until you buy them and then realize that they might be everything you've wished for in a pair of pants. (laughs) Uh, So yeah, you're a great voice of reason there, man. I've already, I've already, I already got the pack. Uh, that's, that's probably going to happen. And then, um, Oh man, the, the bow thing, I, I got a PSE, I was shooting it today and I just can't help but think, you know, what's the difference between my PSE and one of those nice Hoyt carbon defiant ones, you know, that I see, um, Cam Haynes and my buddies that came up here, bow hunting black bear, they had Hoyts and my buddy Jesse has a Hoyt and I got the PSE and that's fine. And I don't know the difference yet, but you can't just be going in on the pants and then getting the pack and then also getting the bow. Cause that's a lot of money. The bow is crazy. They're, they're 12, 1300 bucks. Yeah. That, the carbon, the carbon fiber risers and, and you know, in oh. Fairbanks we can sell it. I was, I had a friend who owned a bow shop here in town and, um, that was kind of the, the thing. Like, oh, you can have, you can have these magnesium risers or the aluminum riser, but this, carbon fiber you know it gets 40 below and you can go outside and shoot it and the bow's not cold because carbon fiber doesn't get cold like that so that was one of his uh little twisted selling points of why you should have a carbon fiber bow instead of something else but you're right i uh i there was one year man it was like 2010 or 11 the school district up here we were supposed to get our you know the, the annual step up that you get for uh, for contract negotiations, but our contract hadn't been finalized. And so at the end of the year, it was like June, I think it was, we all got back pay for what we were supposed to have gotten for that year if the contract had been finished with its negotiation. And so in June, I got a check for, I want to say it was like $600. And I, it was before kids and we were doing all, you know, just my wife and I, and I got the go, I had to go spend it on a bow and I, I went and got a Hoyt and uh, love it it's a fantastic bow but i was talking to you earlier about I, I was in that hunting trip and we rolled our canoe i managed to get downstream of everything and was pulling everything out of the out of the river and got my buddy who was there's there there's a whole story there but my buddy was uh he wouldn't let go of the sweeper so he was like thinking he was gonna die i got we got went back in the river and grabbed him and helped him out and then we kind of accounted for everything I got the jet boil going, got some hot water, uh, got everybody dried off and in, in dry clothes and kind of we're collecting our thoughts and figuring out what we're going to do. Are we warm enough and, and is our stuff dry enough to stay or do we need to make our way back out? And he looked around, he's like, well, why don't we kind of float our way towards the way out and we'll see if you, if you see anything, we'll call along the way. By the way, where's your bow? And, uh, <laughs> it was still in the river and I have like neon yellow fletching, And so I managed to see it from the the bank and had to strip back down, get back in the river and swim out to the sweeper 
and grab it. So it was one of those moments of, I'll probably never have a time where $600 just shows up and I'm able to go and spend it on a bow. Cause no. yeah. Well, actually you do every year as a, as an Alaska resident, you get the perm fund check. Uh, what, where does that usually go now or, and where did it go? Is it like free money that you used to use on gear? What do you use on it now? Um, this past year it was not free money. It was, um, my wife's tuition. So we're working on cash flowing her master's degree. She's going to finishing up this semester, man. So thankful finishing up her master's degree in social work. Um, but prior to that, yeah, it was, it was a gear, it was a gear <laughs> slush fund. Uh, two years ago I bought, um, the like really nice Kuyu Yukon rain pants. And then the year before that I bought the jacket, the, the Yukon jacket, and then I think the year before that, I bought a lifetime membership to Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. And with that came a Seek Outside TP and Titanium Stove. So it's a six-man TP and then a backpacking stove. And that has significantly changed the way I hunt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's my, I know that a lot of people need it for a lot of different things, but it's a when we're able to, I should say, it's a gear slush fund. <laughs> I, I've even looked at canceling entire trips because do I need to go there or should I just live where I am better? And so like, I was going to head down to California and then we're going to drive to Montana to fish to fish Montana and then come back to California. And then I thought, well, no, just take Montana out of the equation. That frees up money that I could save, but then that saving ends up being to enhancing the stuff I'm going to do anyway. So well, I save 600 bucks by not going to Montana. So 600 bucks could be, you know, toward a Hoyt bow or it could be uh, some other sort of gear. So it's not really saving money. It's just putting it in a different area and a different spot. But, uh, you mentioned jet boil. Do you have any, uh, um, MSR products? I do. Um, this past year I gave my brother deer hunts, um, in Wisconsin and he's, he's got his two daughters that go down with him and they sit in a ground blind. And so I mailed him my jet boil. Um, I was looking for something else and I ended up with the MSR pocket rocket too. And so I use that on all my trips this year. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're using? Do you like it better than jet boil? Um, I personally do. I haven't had any problems with it. Um, I could see if you had like a cup or a pot that was too narrow for it, like a jet boil at all fits together and locks in place and you could probably boil water at like a 30 degree incline. Whereas with that, um, you know, the, the stove being separated from the pot that this cooking, um, it's going to be more top heavy and tippy, but I didn't have any problems with it. How much do you have like a pot set or is there any sort of, cooking set that you that you have because i've seen that msr has a wide variety of stuff whereas jet boil is kind of specific to the jet boiling thing and has a couple other products that are kind of similar but um they do have like a dual burner type uh and i'm gonna get on do my own research uh, right here um because everything i'm so limited i go up there and i you get the you boil the water for your mountain house but it would be nice if you're on longer planes or longer trips to have some sort of base camp. I'm going to cook actual things. So if I do want to cook some meat from the, from the animal I just took, if there's a little pan, you know, or there's a way that I could cook something other than just heating water for a mountain house or soup. So jet boil does have, you know, a little pot pan sort of thing and a bigger burner. Um, but what do you, do you, do you cook, cook, or is it just boil the water for your freeze dried stuff? Generally, I'm just boiling water. Um, I do have a little pan that I, that sometimes I'll bring along depending upon what we're doing. Like if I'm, uh, we went sheep scouting this year and that was just like Heather's choice and water to boil. And so that was pretty, uh, you know, pretty lightweight, but I will sometimes pack if we're going to like be on the river and there's a chance to go fishing or things like that. I'll bring other things too that like a pan to cook with. And usually that's just, we'll build a fire and I don't have to worry yeah. about trying to cook over that little pocket rocket. Um, yeah. the other thing that I did pick up and again, I, what's interesting is I keep talking about gear and I keep reminding myself to mention almost everything 
I buy a lot of stuff off Craigslist. Um, I bought the MSR Pocket Rocket 2. Uh, a friend of mine gave me an REI gift card as a thank you. And so I picked up that for like half the price. It would have, I think it's like cost me 20 bucks. Um, I met a guy and bought an MSR Dragonfly stove. Uh, and I picked that up. I want to say for like $60 and that's like $120 stove. He just didn't, he had, I think he was a, like a mountain, a mountaineering guide. He was taking people up different peaks around Alaska and he had a bunch of extra stoves and, um, either sold his business or closed it down and was getting rid of some of his mountaineering stuff. So I bought that that way. And then same thing with my cook, pot. my cook pots are, it's just a, I want to say it's a 16 ounce hard anodized steel cup and a little lid for it. And my, what are they? A little four ounce fuel canister and the MSR pocket rocket too. All that fits inside of it. And it's got like a little nice. mesh bag. Yeah. It's probably two thirds of the height of that jet boil. So it gives me a little bit more room and it's a little bit lighter. I mean, not enough that I would pick it specifically for the weight, but, um, yeah, there's a lot of that stuff. Like if you, especially in Fairbanks, I feel like maybe it might be more than I can catch a can, but there's just a smaller, uh, smaller amount of people. And also it helps a lot having the military bases up here. There's a lot of turnover guys two yeah. years in the interior in the air force or the, the army. And then, buy a bunch of cool stuff to go live the adventure and then get rid of it. Cause they're going to go to, you know, Alabama or Texas or something. Yeah. The, the types of hunts are a little bit different down here too, where you're not necessarily, you're not going to go on a six to eight day blacktail hunt cause you don't have to. It's a lot, a lot of overnight, maybe two day type things get up on the mountain and then you're camping there. So you don't necessarily want to take a lot of stuff, but there is that notion of, or that idea that, oh man, I want to buy this so that I can cook some backstrap or in case I want to cook some backstrap that night around the tent. But am I really going to do that? Yeah. I can convince myself or there's that romantic notion because I saw it on TV or that'd be the perfect end to the hunt. It's nice. I got the deer and it's back at camp. I'm going to stay an extra night. And, uh, by the sunset, I've brought a little bit of, of seasoning and I'm going to have some fresh backstrap and I'm going to you know, cook it on my, you know, my base camp system. Yeah. But am I really going to do that? Or I'm going to go camping on a river and I'm going to float and we're going to have a nice little jet boil dinner or, you know, just like you said, cook it over a fire, which is a lot less expensive. So you don't have the cool gear, but man, your brain just starts creating these images of you using this stuff in this ideal sort of way. Oh yeah. I was going to say, you sound like there's a, since you brought him up, a Cameron Haynes Hoyt ad where he's uh, got a bonfire going and he's got like chunks of elk strap pushed down an arrow shaft, like yeah. a kebab. And that's what I was picturing as you're describing, like, am I really going to do that? Am I really going to have all the, well, marketing says you will. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't even know if it's, if you don't do that, that you're doing anything wrong you know, if you just go up to go up the mountain, day trip it, get your deer, go back home. I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. I mean, you're, you could sleep in your own bed. You don't need as, as much gear because it's just a day trip. So it might be more efficient to do it that way, but it looks cooler, feels better. Uh, you, I mean, you can't feel more primal by doing that because our ancestors didn't have jet boils or MSR gear. So uh, I don't know, man, but yeah, I, <laughs> That's, that's down the list. That's behind the uh, the pack, and then which the pack is is at the top there, and then down there a little bit is uh, is a, a bow, probably Hoyt, but because I got the new tent last year. Oh, nice! What did you get? I got North Face, uh, just a little two man. I was looking at all kinds of tents. It was funny to see. I knew I was gonna uh, it was gonna happen, but you just look through so many different tents and then you end up ordering one and you think, Oh, well that's what I ended up with. I was looking at so many different ones. There's that one from Norway or Denmark or somewhere over there. Yeah, dude. I started seeing a lot of stuff on Facebook and these ads and they look great. There's a lot of little things that have to be done to secure it. But the design with, uh, it, it just looks totally smart. Oh yeah. 
yeah, I was just, I, right before we started the podcast, I was texting a friend of mine. He's been listening to the, uh, gritty Bowman podcast a lot. And he's mm-hmm. like, Oh dude, I need to get all geared up for next year. Like I've been, I'm super amped up. Uh, I was listening to, they've talked a lot about like Kafaru and Sitka and first light and a bunch of their different sponsors. And, um, that's, I, he's his, so he wants to get like, you're talking about like a system, like from base layer to rain gear. He wants to dial in a system. And I was like, man, I want to, I want to get a different tent. And that's what I was just on there. The Hilleberg website. I was like, man, $900 for a tent. Like that's an excellent tent. And I could probably hand that down to my son. And uh, mm-hmm. that's definitely something I consider too. Like the buy once cry once, but I can get two pretty darn good tents for what one excellent tent costs. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's hard when you look at that stuff. Like I was the, both the Barney's bag and I got on Craigslist and then the solo system or the, um, the solo bag and the, uh, I think it was the crux frame, the first stone glacier frame I got used. Uh, but I was looking at the, the Barney's bag. I mean, you're talking 700 bucks, man. And that's, that's, that's real money. That's you start to calculate how many days in the classroom you are going to need to put in to make that happen or how many extra seasons of basketball you're going to have to coach to make that work out. Yeah. It's hard. Completely relative. What I'm complaining about is having to affix bags on the outside of my current bag. So we're not talking about some sort of huge issue. We're not talking about, I don't have a pack at all. And so I need one. So might as well buy it once. Right. Yeah. What I've been using now has worked for multiple hunts. So it's, totally not necessary it's just a matter of how much i'm going to convince myself that i need this i'm looking at one of those tents right now it seemed like all the tents had to be symmetrical like the coleman tents everything is symmetrical and it's nice but those the tents with the extra little you know one again what do they call it the uh um the vestibule yeah, the vestibule. It's not just some small little thing. You almost have to lean your pack against the tent. It's like it's its own separate mud room. Oh, yeah. That's so cool. And I can't believe it hasn't existed until this point. <laughs> but you look at it, the tunnel construction, or it's like a little igloo with the, with the vestibule. It makes total sense how I survived without it. But... You know, yeah. and then you look at the pictures, and it's it's not just the picture of the tent; it's where it is, and so that means that if I buy this tent, oh, I'm going to go to the Brooks Range and I'm going to hunt caribou. No, no, I'm just buying this massive tent. Then I'm going to try to find enough flat ground on some mountain on Prince of Wales Island for for deer, but I'm probably not going to because there's so many little undulations, and any sort of small little depression is filled with water, even if it hasn't rained in a few days. <laughs> that's the, my, a friend of mine has the uh the nalo gt2 or gt3 i think that he guides out of and he was telling me the same thing he's like they're phenomenal tents but he's like you have to find a spot that's like 15 feet long that's flat mm-hmm. for that whole thing to unroll in and, and it's he's yeah. like you're, just, you're not gonna find that in a lot of places um and the other thing too with the the tube style tents is you've got to be able to stake them out and in some of those spots it's hard to get stakes into the ground and if you can't stake that thing down it's not going to stay taut so i was looking at their the yanu i think it's called um but yeah it's like 975 dollar 10 but it's freestanding and it takes a good snow load and you know all those things and dude you're an alaskan resident you should definitely be thinking about what kind of tent you need to do a Brooks range hunt or, um, you know, go out West or hit the Alaska range and go for sheep. That's, that's the dream, right? It is. It's absolutely. And that, that's part of the problem too. Do I want to get a nice new pack or do I want to go on the Epic hunt? Cause essentially what you're talking about oh, is yeah. new piece of gear or plane ticket. Mm-hmm. It is so nice that there are so many areas that you can go and hunt and just a harvest ticket. You don't have to pay a lot of money or, or there's a lot of stuff you don't necessarily have to draw. You can, you can get a, if you're willing to do the work, but that's your plane ticket, you know, Brooks range uh, or to go do a fly out somewhere. That's it's, if I were to buy no gear, then I could save that money or I could just spend that money going somewhere really, really cool. But I'm going there with my current gear. Um, which is, that is actually a perfect little segue to the next, uh, next little thing here. 
Um, I don't have anything. Uh, my largest caliber is a 30 out six, but I usually use my 270. When you're using, uh, you used an aught six for your caribou, right? Yeah, actually, the, that's the only rifle I own. Okay. Have you gone for brown bear or grizzly? No, um, I hunted in areas where they're at. And, um, you know, if you've got a 200 grain or 220 grain round, like a good bonded bullet, I think you're in pretty good shape for a brown bear. Um, but I think that takes a certain type of personality to really want to go hunt a big brown bear. And, uh, I just don't have that in me like black bears. Absolutely. Caribou moose definitely count me in, but I don't know. Um, just don't, I just haven't had that come up as something I really want to do yet. Um, they they say that it's more about shot placement than anything, which is totally true. And they say that if you really, if you get a larger weapon, but you're more likely to flinch, then you take away all the extra knockdown power because you've made a a poorer shot. So if you go a a, a rifle that you're comfortable with, and you hit the spot you're aiming for, then that's going to be a lot better than just gunning up for the sake of gunning up. Part of me wants to do brown bear hunt just because for the same, for the same reason that, that you are not really sure that it's in you, I'm not going to be doing it to eat it. Like I'm going to eat some, for sure. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get the, the, the meat, but I'm not going to be as excited about it uh, as like a spring black bear. I want to get the spring black bear and I want to eat the heck out of it. Whereas the brown bear, like, okay, I'm going to eat it, but it's a little bit more reluctant. So is it just a gratuitous, oh, proving myself to be an a apex hunter because I'm going after a brown bear or they are predators and there's nothing eating them. So is there an issue? I, I don't know. But I'm curious. I'm I'm very curious about it, and at some point, I'm thinking about doing it. Oh yeah, um, I, and I think too. I mean, if you got away from the coast in the fall, like you're talking Brooks Range or uh, Alaska Range, you got them up high in the berries. I think that'd be a pretty good eating bear. I don't think you'd have to worry too much about um, taste or texture in terms of those things. But yeah, I think it's, it's interesting. I hear this conversation, especially around bears a lot. You know, if you're not planning on eating the whole thing, then, then why? And then other people are like, oh, well, you know, it, it's symbolic of something or, um, you know, sadly, I think for some people it does turn into a, like a chest thumping opportunity, uh, yeah. which is, I don't know. I, I don't know. It's hard. I don't, I don't ever want to like condemn somebody that's doing something legally, uh, and, and pursuing something and they've fulfilled all their obligations to the, the law of harvesting that animal. But I do feel, I don't want to say morally or ethically, that might be a little judgmental, but I'll say morally that they're they, like, you owe something more to it than to go and shoot it and skin it. Mm-hmm. Um, well, there are certain areas where it- they are the main predator. And if, and if you're praying, you know, Southeast Alaska, the wolves are, are a huge issue, especially Prince of Wales Island, that the, the deer population is, you know, thought to be really, really down because the wolf population is, is way up. And even though the quota was, co- uh, was reached after two weeks and they shut down the, uh, the trapping season, you know, wolves being predators. And if it's eating, you know, primary food source, which is deer, then is there some sort of moral obligation to rather than complain about the wolves, then maybe you go out there and try to get a wolf or two yourself because you want deer, everyone else wants deer, but if there's only a limited few people who are willing to go out during the winter to get wolves, which are decimating the population of deer. Well, you're just complaining about it. you're not doing anything to help solve the problem. Yeah. So in areas up north, I'm sure that's the case. It's a little different because you don't have, you know, Made packs of grizzlies running around, but as far as gosh, that'd be terrible. <laughs> I can't even imagine that. Okay. Um, but you know, if, that, if that's an issue, if they're getting too close to town, or if, if they are kind of kind of chomping on some populations, then um, you know, take take one out. But like you said, it's now I'm not going to judge. And then the method of taking it, it's easy to say, well, there are certain animals that taking it with a bow is no big deal, but why would you want to go take a, a brown bear or a grizzly with a bow? I don't know why anyone would, but it's just the next step. 
you take a you take a brown bear with a with a rifle, right? And say you eat it. Let's say you you know put the put the hide on your wall or, or you sell it or whatever. And then, well, I'm going to see if I can be a hunter enough to get close enough and shoot one with a bow. <sighs> Again, type of person with those sort of nerves is that's that's next level. Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think it was a Fred Bear that was talking about. I think one of his quotes was. Um, if the young people in this generation really wanted a thrill, they should go pick up a stick and string and pursue brown bears. Like I, I, I'm totally misquoting him. I'm sure. But that was the, the essence of it, that absolutely like to be in that close and to put yourself in that level of vulnerability willingly, you know, much it's different than when you unzip your tent and it happens to be there, but to go and, and, have the nerves to get in close. You're like, Oh, just so, you know, I got to get 20 yards closer. Oh, I got to get in then to do it with, you know, compound bow is one thing. And then with a trad bow, you're talking within 30 yards for most people. Um, yeah, that takes, well, we, that takes, we all, we all want to know that we have what it takes and, you know, kids in general, they challenge themselves. It's not a, a conscious sort of thing, but they want to challenge themselves against, you know, things they want to go outside and run around and be adventurous. And our society doesn't, it's, it's not necessary. It's not a necessary part. We don't have those rites of passages that, uh, the civilizations have had before where you have to, you know, becoming a man means to go out there and kill your first deer or you have to go live, you know, out in the woods. The native Americans had those sort of rites of passage, uh, for, for young men. We don't have those sort of things anymore. The only way that we really prove if we have what it takes is like in the athletic sort of realm, which is becoming increasingly more egotistical and, you know, self-promoting rather than, you know, our like battlefield metaphors are now used for sports rather than real situations when you had to be a part of whatever was protecting the, the town from warring tribes or warring, you know, groups of people. It doesn't matter if you were in Norway 500 years ago or whatever. We don't have that anymore, but that residual primal, whatever test ourselves still does remain. And people get curious about it. People who've never been hunting before they come up and they're just around predators and it lights something inside them. That's been you know, bludgeoned out by urban society. I've had friends that have come up to Alaska and, and they say, well, you know, if we don't fish, then I don't even care. That's fine. But after they've actually fished and actually they, you know, they, they're providing and they're out there and they're doing something that just makes them awakens them on a level that they have not previously experienced. It's, it's incredible. It's exhilarating for them. And it's fun to see too. And then, you know, you go from catching fish, your first fish at age 40, all the way up to bow hunting for brown bear. It's that same sort of thing, that same sort of trait. Can I do this? Um, it's a real experience and it's important. It's valuable. It's just different from person to person. And it's, it's really tough to judge. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that it's, um, you know, I, I, in our last podcast, I was talking about my caribou hunt and in it, that was the first time, like I was, it was me and my younger brother that I should say it was my younger brother and I, <laughs> and I had never been the guy in charge of, taking apart the animal. Like I was always doing it with another person that had done this more frequently, more often was better at it. And I could always ask, you know, Hey, is it, it's this thing, right? I'm doing it this way. Right. And being that guy to be the one that my brother was asking me and to be in charge of the whole thing from putting the boat in the water to getting all the meat back to be the, the guy like that absolutely is a, a rite of passage. And it made me feel like I had uh, learned a lot in the hunting season since I started. And I think that it's a big part of, you know, it's cliche to sound like sounding like a man or something like that, but it was something I definitely, uh, marked down as a milestone in, in manhood. Yeah. Something that I want my son to experience. It's something that I want. Um, you know, I, I bump into students that, uh, you know, we, inevitably come up on hunting conversations and whether it's their tactics to try to get me off topic or something. But, um, you know, I have students that their parents aren't into that at all. They'd be like, well, you know, what, what would you do? Like, is there a way to go with you? Is there a way like, I always tell them like after you graduate, 
sure, I'll take you out after you're 18 and you can make that decision. Sure. Absolutely. You know, you can just come along. You don't have to worry about pulling the trigger or, um, I've had a couple students approach me about that stuff and say, you know, it's really interesting to me, but I don't know anyone else that would take me out. Yeah. Um, to, to know now that I've done all that on my own, I feel like I'm more capable of taking people that ask me about it and taking on, um, like a men, like a hunting mentor role. And I've even found, and I was asking around, I found out that there's a, I can't remember the name of the organization right now, but they will, you can become a member and you, they'll carry you on their liability insurance for doing mentorship and doing stuff like that. Wow. Yeah. That there's enough of a need that people recognize that we need to get young people and new hunters and new hikers and out into the wilderness. And there is a, you know, an element of risk for being the person that says, yeah, I'll take you that there's an organization that'll insure you for that. Wow. Yeah. That makes sense though. You know, you, the, the, the therapy, we've talked about this before, the, the therapy that so many people are prescribed is go outside, you know, do real things. And when people return to their urban lives, they're sad. And you, when the, you said, <coughs> the whole be a man thing and that's being driven out of our of our society because being a man are the most harmful words that i've ever heard growing up or they harmed me it just depends on what your interpretation of being a man is and so if being a man is taking care of your responsibility and being able to provide great that doesn't mean and this is it's taken out of context sometimes well a woman can provide no she can absolutely provide all right i'm not saying that me as a provider means that i am you know, I can do this and women can't. I'm just saying that my responsibility speaking only on behalf of myself means that I should be in a place where I can provide, I can take care of what I need to take care of. I can be responsible. Um, but you can't say that anymore. You know, it's with, without, there has, there, there's an explanation that has to come with it in the same way that will you have to explain why you want to hunt. If you can go to the store and you can get this stuff, why do you want to go out and seek out the killing of an animal? Yeah. You used to be a thing. And now it's something that you have to explain because society has become increasingly urbanized and that urban think where, why do you live such an archaic lifestyle? Why can't you just evolve and, and, progress to where everyone else is why do you have to be holding on to those old days that that we've evolved past and it's it's or devolved is probably what i would say then kind of goes to our question um we both talked about how we like uh fahrenheit 451 as a book um that question that montag has asked are you happy oh wow. and, and <laughs> I spend so much time getting such rich discussions with the kids about that and so much of what's going on in the U S are you, are you happy? And can people answer that? And have they convinced myself they are happy when really they're not? And you know, the character Montag has to think about that. And it really is a central question. Uh, yeah. And that's, <laughs> And then you get you, when you connect that into well, that's probably a weird sound. When you connect that into hunting, does killing things make you happy? I think that's one of the questions I get a lot. That, like, yeah. You just you feel a part of something. You feel like uh, like something's being fulfilled. Oh, so it's fulfilling to kill things. And it's uh, yeah, I feel. I was listening to uh, the Meat Eater podcast lately, and they had a couple of a couple of things on there. It's almost like, you know, as a hunter, I feel like as hunters we're constantly under scrutiny, I think the latest numbers came back and like five or 6% of the population in the U S hunts. So 94% of the population doesn't, and yet we're still allowed to do it. So we have to constantly be advocating and sending out the image that, you know, just killing things make us happy. No, but hunting does. And then like to not even really have the words to sort of dissect those things and say, this is the part that I feel a little bit of, you know, remorse about maybe, maybe that's the word, like a little bit of sadness, like, but that's the reality of living in a place where it takes death to make life continue to happen. Whether you choose to eat salad or whether you choose to eat meat, um, unless it's being, 
synthetically created in a factory, something's dying to feed you and life creates life. Uh, but yeah, there's something about, there's something satisfying about getting it yourself. And I don't know why it is with meat or, uh, like we've been doing a lot of gardening lately. Why, why bringing home food in particular is satisfying. Um, I don't make my own clothes and I don't know that I would feel the same level of satisfaction about like, you know, having yaks and, uh, taking and, and making yarn and then sweaters out of that, that I get out of going and procuring my own protein. But I think that, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we know that we're happy? Yeah. Um, I think that without getting like too deep or philosophical, I mean, when I stop and think about things overall, for sure, I feel like I've got a, a good life and I'm happy and I'm happy about the people I share it with, but there's also a lot of conscious decision-making in that, that yeah. is going to make it so that I'm happier. Um, man, I was reading, have you heard of an, uh, antinatalist standpoint? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh man, I was, I'd stumbled upon an article where the guy had claimed to be antinatalist, which is, um, they think that it is morally and ethically wrong to have children because life is sadness. Like if you were to have, and, and he goes on to clarify, like if you were to have the equal amount of sad and happy events in your life, sadness sticks with you longer. Like if you think about somebody dying, how long that sticks with you versus something like when you buy a new car or you get married, how long those levels of happiness stay with you. So because the sadness is greater than the happiness, even if it was the same amount of events, the sadness is heavier. Therefore life is sad. And then I was like, everyone always come at, comes back with to, to him and says, well then why don't you kill yourself? And he's like, well, the only thing worse than living is death because then it's just, it's nothing. And I was like, man, what a horrible life to live. Pretty dark. The only thing better or the only thing worse than living right now is my, you know, eventual and inevitable death. Wow. How do you go (laughs) from day to day? Um, Have you read uh, Tribe by uh, Younger? I have not yet. There's a, a quote in there. It says contemporary society or modern society, whatever I'm paraphrasing here has mastered the art of making people feel unnecessary. And I think a lot of the reason <sighs> the evidence that hunting and that sort of lifestyle is so astonishing is because there's no way that one person can perfectly put into words how they feel when it's going on. It's such a rich experience that people just fumble around when trying to describe what it is. And when people don't have that, they feel so unnecessary and they don't have real experiences. And when you have such a rich, real experience, like I am providing for myself, I am the master of I'm surviving. And it's such a deep thing. It's so hard to describe we have made things so easy that people live lives in which they don't have real things. And that question of, are you happy can be really difficult for them to come to terms with. And I I feel, I feel a little bit guilty and bad that I had a good life and I enjoyed my time in California, but I, I have the day in day out just zest for life in Alaska that I did not have in California. And I, the reason I feel bad is because I have some around some really good people. And so I don't want to make it sound like they were good people, but they weren't fulfilling enough. And those relationships and those friendships weren't fulfilling enough. But just the fact that I get to every single day live things that are so real. And if I want to go outside and have those rich experiences, I can have them so easily. I feel like I just graduated college and like the entire life is in front of me. You know, when you're just, we're getting it now, you know, and we're excited. I I feel like that. And that, that deep sort of happiness, that's impossible to explain. But if you were to ask me when I was in California, yeah, I'm I'm pretty happy. I'm happy with, with the way things are going, but I've found just a different level because again, it stirred something within me. That's unlike anything that I've had before. Cause when you're in high school, growing up in Alaska, it's, it's different. Right. But I think a lot of people are just lacking in that. And so they don't understand why life would necessitate 
hiking up a mountain and killing an animal and enjoying it, you know, posting a picture on Facebook of you cutting up the flesh of an animal. And it's out of that lack of understanding to where, how can you think that that's good or that's happy or that that's fulfilling or it's just that, that disconnect. And then you have, you know, people who aren't even anti-hunting people just don't have anything at all. And they don't feel any sort of purpose in, in, in that book tribe. Um, he, he reports on people who lived during war times and how they had a purpose and they had a point. And so they almost miss aspects of war and that connection to other people that they don't have in, in, in everyday life that after nine 11, um, uh, veterans with, uh, post-traumatic stress reported less stress and, and, and fewer, uh, instances occurrences of, of things that were traumatic and they they required less therapy because they had been attacked again and so the entire town was galvanized the country was galvanized and so they felt a purpose they felt a part of something and so even though it was really dark and bad and traumatic there was a purpose um there was he did some reporting in uh, yugoslavia and sarajevo when all that was going on and how people every day there was a point um, during World War II, when London was being bombed by the Blitz, how people were together and they were galvanized and they were they were unified in that. And it wasn't a, a psychological, we're going to break them down and we're so emotionally defeated because the Germans are bombing us. It was, you know, forget you, Germany. You know, we're, we're banding together. And if you don't have something that makes you feel alive, you're not connected to anything. If you are, if you do subscribe to entertain me through TV or I'm sad and pills. Gosh, it's, it's sad. It's tragic. Yeah. I think, I think that you're right. That with things getting easier, it's, it's, we've confused happiness with um, like procuring long life as though if I can live a long time, it might not matter how I live. I'll live for a long time and be alive for a while. And that's, that's a good thing. And that'll make me happy instead of, uh, what was it? Muhammad Ali. Don't count the days, make the days count. Yeah. Like that. It doesn't man. I think, I think that you're right with, you know, there is something about climbing to the top of the mountain and taking an animal and being exposed to the elements and entering back into the food chain where you're, there are packs of wolves and grizzly bears and long ways to fall. And, exposure and hypothermia and the, all of that, that bringing yourself to the, um, opening yourself, exposing yourself to, to things that can end your life makes you feel like when you come out of it, a, you know how to deal with those things, but B lets you know that you aren't permanent, that you, you, there's a thousand things that could happen between now and tomorrow morning that would make it so that you don't get to wake up. Yeah. And I think that a lot of that, um, if you don't feel like this is a gift, then I don't, I don't know how you can be happy. If you just expect these things to happen and, uh, expect that to, to everything to always be perfect. Like you were saying, the people in during the blitzkrieg in London, like it galvanized them. It gave them a sense of togetherness. Like there might be a bomb that falls and gets us all. But for right now, like this is what our job is and we're doing that and we're doing it together. And there's a huge amount of value in that. And, you're right. We medicate with things that will help us live longer. But what is the quality of our life at any point should be what's determining whether or not we're happy. Yeah. Yeah. But you mean the quality, quality is, is interpretation. Um, quality, accessibility, things, things that are around. Quality is having, you know, so many things easily accessible when it comes to your Starbucks, your Trader Joe's, your shopping, your this or that, but it's just all man-made nonsense. You know, there's nothing natural there. Um, and the ability for people to individually determine and define those words seems like it's getting, you know, encroached upon. And that's, that's sad too. In a free country, you can't just, this is how I'm going to determine my happiness. There was some, I mean, I would look at some people and say, that's crazy. That's not right. You're infringing on the rights of others. But you know, like, this is a thing. The way we live in Alaska is a thing. Um, but I don't know, man. It's, it certainly makes me want to go hunt. I'll tell you what, man. Just talking about this, it's, it's, the sun's already down. 
and I'm sure it's been down up there for a little bit, but man, it makes me want to go hunt. It makes me want to get out there for sure. Get on a mountain and, and have something real. Oh yeah, absolutely. We're, uh, I'm going to go meet my buddy tomorrow. He's looking at putting together a whole system. So I was like, I've got a, got my Rubbermaid action packer full of my gear. I'll meet you up and we're almost the same size so he can try stuff on. And it's, it's that time of year. When I first moved up here, uh, the assistant principal at the school, when I started teaching said, never do anything drastic in February. And so as we get closer to February, I, I remember those words. Cause he's like, people buy houses, get divorced, buy cars. They can't afford we do drastic things in February because everybody's getting crazy with the dark and with the cold. And so I turn it into, I've inventoried all my hunting gear. Uh, I'm going to get a scale and weigh it because that's what weird people do. And <laughs> February sounds like a good time to do that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you've got to, you got to have an outlet. Cabin fever is real. And so especially this time of year when it is dark already and it's cold and you get super, super anxious. Like I'm, I agree. I'm ready to go hunt again. Um, even if it's just take the dog out and the bow and go find some grouse or something, but just to get outside and enjoy that is really, really nice. I went out this morning, um, hiked for about two hours and it was, I got off the trail, which is, I like to do like hiking on a trail is nice, but it's nice to just walk through. And there's a, there's an area that's somewhat close to town that I'm just becoming really familiar with. Um, walking it a lot. So I'm finding little spots and, you know, where tracks. So it's like really, really early scouting for next year's rut, but it's nice to know a mountain or know an area on, on such intimate terms because you walk through it and it's not the, the organized trail. It's the off it. And so, um, but yeah, it was, it was low fifties today. Oh, nice. Yeah. What, uh, what do you got going on up there? <laughs> today it was it was actually like 10 above 14 above but very very windy hmm. yeah it wasn't even it wasn't even real windy it was here it was it was calm and, and warm it really felt like a like a spring day but you know it's january mid-january so it's it's just a teaser um but yeah it's so nice to be able to just go out and and do that and up north there it's you're still locked in for for a while you're not going to have a one of those escape type days, one of those early, early, early spring teasers. You're uh, when, when do you get consistently above freezing? Uh, usually like end of March, beginning of April, we're hitting above freezing enough to get some snow melt, but then at night it'll drop down below by the end of April. We're usually above zero or I'm sorry, above freezing, um, you know, all day. And then definitely by the beginning of May, we're, things are definitely melting off in the last little bit of snow. The rivers are all high and the last little bit of snow is finishing off. I'm looking at tomorrow's forecast. We get a little spring teaser. It's going to be 21. Oh, so nice. I can go running without a face mask. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's got it. How long are your runs and how often do you do them during the winter? Uh, I try to get out, especially now that we have a dog at least twice a week for two, two to three miles. And it usually ends up being a kind of a, a run run walk where the air it's cold and the air just feels so thin that if you go for too long, there's people that do it. I don't want to say that it's impossible, but there's people that do it. Um, but for me, it's, you just get that cold lung and just coughing and it's not fun. Yeah. You get that, like your lungs are bleeding, very minerally type taste in your mouth. It's not. Yeah. Everything tastes like pennies. Yeah, I, I can't imagine that's fun. But then it gets it gets really warm really quick there. I was up there in late May, maybe early June, a couple of years ago, and it was real nice, seventies and and sunny, and you know everything was just really really green. China was still kind of high, but got some uh, got some grayling. Uh, yeah, does when it, when it turns the corner, does it does it get summery pretty quick? It does. Um, it usually does. We've been here for ten years and. I would say seven of them have been that kind of quick, you know, by the beginning of June, things are awesome. You know, all the bears are up, um, all the snow's gone. Usually we're like mid fifties overnight and then you're hitting low seventies during the day or high sixties during the day. It's great. And then sometimes by the end of June, you're hitting eighties into July too. So yeah, it's the summers in Fairbanks are fantastic. Don't tell me that one. 
the winner yeah. they're terrible they're, they're terrible let me tell you about the winners um but no yeah my wife i couldn't convince my wife to stay here if it wasn't for our nice summers yeah i got a buddy who's in uh anchorage and he did a float for caribou and he's gotten moose and yeah, every weekend there's somewhere else to drive to when you're on the road system like that. So many different units that are accessible so easily. And so I thought I'm going to head up there next summer or even this summer. I was thinking about it, but to get up there, it's pretty expensive. If I put the boat, if I put my truck on the boat, it's 600 bucks one way to get the Hanes and then 14 hour drive down to the Kenai Peninsula. So I'm, this is, that's a ton of time and a ton of money, gas money. And then, you know, the put it on the boats, so it's, it's real expensive. But if you live there and you're on the, on the road system, it's a lot less cumbersome. Yeah, definitely. He's really nice for what it is, but as far as exploring other other areas of Alaska, it's, it's pretty tough. People always ask me, have you been all around the state? You just drive and drive? And I can't. Southeast, it's, it's a different animal. So it's almost cheaper for me to go and spend money to go back down to California or go somewhere else. But you know, I, there's a lot of, of, of Alaska I haven't seen yet. And so much of it you can't drive to. You, know? you can't drive to Nome and, and go check that out. But yeah. I'd like to get out there. Yeah, that'd be an interesting spot too. I'm, I know there's a couple guys I know that have gone out there and hunted caribou. And I don't think you can right now. I think they closed it to anybody who's not subsistence. Um, but yeah, that's a, a really cool part of the state. I'd like to get out that way. But you're right. That's most of our plans for next summer include driving, like hitching. I've, we've got a little pop up camper. Hitch up that pop up camper and head down to Homer. I've got a friend that lives down there. Um, and then maybe caravan with another family from, from Fairbanks and stop in Anchorage. We'll work it out. I'll send you an email and you can jump up. Oh. We'll pick you up in Anchorage and go down for a week. Oh, there's so much to see. I've been to Seward. We, uh, my aunt and uncle live in Wasilla. So we went up there and then uh, drove down to Seward and there's just so much to see. It's so different. The interior is so different than the peninsula. I mean, just massive land. Um, area difference so you're driving a long way but there's just so much to see i should i should really just take the entire summer or i I take at least a month and just go and and check it out but then if you go in in july or you go in in august or september you're looking at different fish you're looking at different animals you're going to go up there to hunt you're going to go up there to uh to fish or try to do both it's it's overwhelming but it's a really good problem to have with having so much so accessible so i should really just not buy anything so i can save money to go do a mega trip there next summer but i'll i after the pack after i buy that pack (laughs) then i'll start saving right yeah after that next thing i'll definitely change my ways after the next one as long as i buy it in january then i'm not making a big decision in february right exactly you got two more weeks you're good to go good to go plenty of time plenty of time but all right man well uh I got a roll here. Uh, now you got, uh, got uh, family waiting on you, but, um, thanks for, uh, uh, gear episode here. It's uh, good stuff. You got any, uh, any closing thoughts before we wrap this one up? I, I think my only closing thought would be, uh, uh, you should always do the adventure in place of getting new gear. If you have to choose one or the other, do you, you, <laughs> you know enough now you, you've got enough gear to make it work. <laughs> I mean, guys, I watched some hunting videos a couple weeks ago and they were hunting sheep in like denim jeans and, uh, you know, flannels. So if you can, if they can shoot, if they can shoot big sheep with the chafing that comes with wearing jeans in the mountains, yeah, whatever we got will probably suffice. Absolutely. I'm just going to, uh, that, that's a good closing thought. And then when I re listen to this, I'll just stop it after you said you should buy it. Cause, uh, you gave me contradictory advice there at, uh, about an hour ago. You were, Oh yeah, you should got to buy it. It's going to make things better so. because it's someone else's money. It's always easier when it's someone else's money. <laughs> that's true. That's true. I got you. <laughs> well, thanks again, man. Uh, stay, stay warm. Uh, and, um, we will, uh, we'll talk to you soon. I'm sure I'll, um, probably uh give uh give barney's a call on uh on tomorrow if they're open yeah. and uh see what uh, we can do there but uh so okay. all right man yeah. thanks again appreciate it and uh we'll uh we'll talk to you later sounds good we'll see you later thanks for tuning in make sure you go to the mediocrealaskan.com check out content columns and features and pictures and videos and everything else southeast alaska and we will talk to you next time